Among the most acclaimed of Indian journalists and public speakers, Mr. Utpal Chatterjee, who was until recently the Honorable Sheriff of Calcutta and its first citizen, has interviewed 18 heads of state, nine Nobel laureates, and traveled with Indian prime ministers as a part of their respective media delegations. Having done his fellowship in journalism from Oxford, he has traveled abroad on other official assignments more than 50 times across most of the continents of the world. He is on the panel of experts of BBC London and the editor in India of Leaders. He has recently been recognized for being an outstanding Indian for his contribution to enriching national values, public service, and international journalism by NIFI. In December 2018, he was recognized as a legend of Bengal by All India Human Rights Council. Incidentally, he has just returned from the Peace Builders Conference at Kuala Lumpur, where he excelled in his deliberations with UNHCR and the World Bank. To come to the stage and speak for the team. Good evening, uh, Mr. Shorvaji Chakravarti, former Deputy Director General of ICCR. Um, my friend, Mr. Gautam De, present Director of ICCR here. The very distinguished uh, dignitaries who have been invited, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when you speak, it should not be a one-way affair. I should also get to see you just as you get to see me. Right. Is that better? Not too loud? Good. I've been asked to speak on the wonder that is India. Not that there is a very difficult proposition that, but that all of you would agree that India is like no other country in the world. And that's not the only reason we will think it to be wondrous. I do remember many years ago, traveling from Oxford to Durham, where I came across an Indian family, or a family of Indian origin, where I met a very small girl, a small girl who today has born a small girl herself. At that point of time, that girl was all full of questions about India. So I had to start telling her whatever I knew whatever history I had read in school, whatever history I had read much later on my own, and of course, a lot else. But then I realized, you know, she wanted to ask certain questions with a particular bent of mind. It looked like she had preconceived notions about why her family, which was of Indian origin, had migrated to England and settled there, because life was far more comfortable than here. And I could understand that, and I did try to answer that. But let me veer away and get back to that much later, if I can. For the time being, let, it, let us also understand. And at the beginning, you saw a video that showed you a little bit of the remnants of an ancient civilization. When we talk of ancient civilizations, there have been attempts to find out which is the oldest. And not very surprisingly, they think the oldest civilization they've come across has been the one from Mesopotamia, which is in the Middle East, you know, which also includes the country that is now in its seventh year of its civil war, Syria, and of course its immediate neighbors. Mesopotamia, but when you think of the civilization of Mesopotamia, that would do anyone proud, very proud, for a multitude of reasons that we need not go into right now. Indus Valley Civilization comes, well, much after that. But then, ladies and gentlemen, I have news for you. Not too long ago, the first attempt was made in the 70s, to be precise, in 73, 74, or thereabouts. The second attempt was made in 1997, by a team of French archaeologists. They had suspected 
that there was something not very far from where the remnants of the present or what we know as Indus Valley Civilization or the remnants of Mohenjo Daro and Harappa happened to be. And lo and behold, in these two excavations, they found out something that you will still find in your map. Unfortunately, now it falls in the Baluchistan area. That place is called Mehergar. So, thereby, we start with the Mehergar civilization. Amazing civilization. It beats all other civilizations if you are to look at it from the perspective, from today's perspective. I'll just give you some headlines, that's all. Can you imagine a civilization where they have a modern surface transport system just like ours, or just like any of the developed nations? I mean, Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok or Singapore. I mean, that was no less. Well, you didn't have cars then, you didn't have petrol then, but of course, the surface transport system was designed in a very, very modern way. Similar was the case with the port. They did not have huge cruisers or ships or passenger ships, you know, that were in vogue, you know, even till, let's say, mid last century, when people would go to England or to the States, you know, two, two legged affair. In the sense that there was one leg to one part and then another leg to the States. This, these people ate much of the same diet as we eat today. These people lived very peacefully. These people were also very aesthetic. There were a lot of arts and crafts. They could, so far they have discovered figurines. I mean, that shows a little bend towards uh, depicting women in tiny little sculptures and they had that some other paintings in odd places. But by in no way could you look down on them as people who lived so far away that, you know, they were a subject of what we call the greater revolution. No. They were neither the origin of whatever species, species you have in mind, nor was it, was it uh, well, a civilization that could be called backward. The simple reason, in those days the people were buried. Did they have a religion? Nobody knows. The French archaeologists did deduce a lot, but they could not quite determine whether these people had a religion. But they knew that all of them were buried after death, which is why they could come across fossils, quite a few fossils. And from the fossils, I do not know if any of the ladies or gentlemen in the audience happen to be associated with dental surgery. Is there anyone here? No, I'm talking about dental, Raju. Dental, to be specific. Anybody? Gentleman who tried to intercede happens to be a pharmacist of repute. You see, so he can he can suggest even from doctors' prescriptions what medicines are meant for what, but he doesn't know the origin of dental surgery. Uh, be that as it may, when I've asked a few dental surgeons, when was root canal treatment? discovered. When? You know, I've had different answers from 50 years to 75 years to 100 years to 125 years. But would you believe it? It is 13,000 years old. If you were to find out from the archaeologist's deductions, the French archaeologist's deductions from what they had found in Mehergar, the Molar, the root canal treatment, everything was there. So can you imagine how advanced they could be and they were a peaceful race. The population has been calculated to be in the region of 25,000. That's all. It's not a very populated race. And 25,000 is no indication of the fact that one day the land where the greater India, where this was all found, would shoot up to 1.3 billion. There's no indication. Be that as it may, this is a great discovery. After that, there have been several civilizations. Some of them deliberately by the river because man always wanted 
to really be involved in agriculture. That was the real source of food. Food and water was what drew people close to the river. And then, of course, we have heard a lot about Malana Abdul Kalam Azad and education. Well, they also learned a great deal in their own way to study and read. There has been evidence in several civilizations of rock paintings, the cave paintings. We have cave paintings even in India. You don't have to go very far. The one, of, one of the greatest things about India we find, if we are going to take a little break from civilizations and come, let's say, in the last 2,000 years, we find something very interesting. We find that our country has been invaded and plundered mercilessly. When I say mercilessly, I mean it absolutely that, mercilessly. In the first phase, you had Alexander the Great coming. It was here that his troops and he became tired. The Alexander was Alexander, ever aggressive, ever wanted to be on the move. But then even in this place, somebody, there was a very brave lot of people within this country, and somebody attempted to shoot him or assassinate him. So an arrow went and hit his chest. A lot of medical, whatever, if you call it science, well, medical science or whatever treatment worked, Alexander survived during that trip. We all know about Alexander Porus, of course. But then came, not too long later, the Mughal era. And the Mughal era, of course, if you think of all the emperors, we think of one person who stood for communal harmony, who wanted India to live in peace. He even combined the best of all the religions that he could find. And that was Akbar. And he was Akbar. So great were his, uh, well, ideas that he has been known in history as Akbar the Great. And uh, the disintegration of every such invasion and empires occurs when some people try a little too hard. I still remember when I was in school, there were some people who were full of praise for Aurangzeb. Why? Because they thought he was a great administrator. I don't know what they meant. But I did know that he was very intolerant of other religions, of people belonging to other religions. He certainly did not believe in communal harmony. But after Aurangzeb died, well, that signaled the end of the Mughal Empire, all but. Because around that time, there were other people who realized this exotic land, which Columbus wanted to discover first and headed the other way, and therefore went towards the United States and discovered America. The natives are called Indians. Indians because Columbus thought he had discovered India. So he called the natives Indians. And of course, the later people who came called them Red Indians. The other person who came and discovered was none other than Vasco da Gama. He was very hesitant. Came a large sheep. A ship accompanied by three other ships, this side, that side, and the hind side. You see, when he came to the Cape of Good Hope, he came across a very enterprising Gujarati. Let's not go into names. And this Gujarati helped him to come to Goa. And therefore, from the outside world, they discovered the exotic land called India. Well, I mean, the Portuguese also came and took hold of Goa, we all know about that. And we also know how General Jain Choudhury, much later in the, in the last century, got hold of both Goa and Hyderabad. We know all about that, that's history. But then the fact remains that the interest that was generated during Mehergarh, during Indus Valley civilization, of trading with the foreign countries, grew a great deal more after a few thousand years when other people started showing more curiosity and more interest in India. His spices, his gold, oh, so many things. The problem with India, of course, as we all know since school, when he's studying history, is the fact that we had a lot of fiefdoms, a lot of nawabs, a lot of kings, 
and they were parallelly at war and differences with one another, which made it very easy for the East India Company when it handed over the reins to the British government for them to start colonization of this country. Well, there are a lot of people who swear by colonization and the, color, and the British for what they, what you call the leaving the, or for us inheriting their infrastructure like the railways. But remember, the British did nothing but nothing for Indians. They did everything for their convenience and to move things faster. Not very surprisingly, researchers in three different universities, starting with Columbia in the United States, have figured out that the amount of money moved out of India is equivalent to 43 trillion dollars, spelled with a T, trillion dollars. Which is why around the turn of the independence, the Indian economy, which at one point of time comprised 23% of the world economy, shrunk so much that 90% of our population lived below the poverty line. Ladies and gentlemen, 90%. The 70 some odd years later after the independence, if our population below the BPL has come down considerably, well, it's thanks to the efforts of a free and democratic India. Much has to be spoken in favor of all the leaders with good intent, no matter what the corruption on the, on the side. This is a fact. India was looted. And looted so badly. That's what I want to talk about. And these were the people, mind you, in not a single class, they keep speaking of teaching the children and teaching the colleges and teaching the universities all about the colonization. When the world went around, the sun never sets on, or sets on the British Empire. But let me tell you, the first Brexit was from here, not from the European Union. Now they're in a mess. And you really need a messy or the whole family of messies to help Theresa May get over Brexit. Because such is the mess. They are now a tiny island at the mercy of the European Union, at the mercy of somebody whose sanity is always always comes under question a man who is known as a certain Donald Trump. This is the state. And through it all, India has not survived, it has thrived because from being a, a virtually reduced to a non-entity, today it is the fifth largest economy in the world, ladies and gentlemen. And that is not coming from me, that is not coming from the Indian media, that is not coming from any Indian source, that is coming from both the World Bank, from the United Nations records. This is a very good thing indeed. India is doing far, far better than we ever had imagined. Everything has evolved. Could you have thought India making it to the Mars even before the NASA could? Could you have thought India would send it's stuff in the, in the space race, India would rank so high. It's a different thing that we have nuclear you know, bombs as deterrents. Well, all countries you know, have deterrents. All the major countries. But then you see, I am one for all bombs, to do away with all bombs. Leave the nuclear power on, if only for non-carbon energy. We need solar energy, we need other kinds of energy. Very soon we'll have electric cars. Now that probably will be a generation or two generations later in India. We already have electric cars in Germany. And in so many other countries. You have Tesla, you have several other countries. I mean, several, you have got Mercedes, BMW, they're all trying for electricity. But what will happen to Middle East, I wonder? What will happen to Russia? What will happen to America? What will happen to Venezuela? Venezuela in any case is in a very, in very dire space. But we are talking of India. Ladies and gentlemen, I have taken a lot of your time. I could have gone on speaking. But suffice it to say that India has proved since the last 13 years to be an absolute wonder. 
a country which never ever tried to invade, be aggressive, a, a country which always had its arms open. That explains why Dalai Lama and his ilk, his kind, have found shelter here in 1959. That is what explains why so many people have sought refuge and got asylum in our country. Our country has always, always stood by certain principles and certain values. Ladies and gentlemen, we all are here, not only because we love ICCR, but also because we are all Indians and we love India. That does not make two mistakes. I, just like I'm a born optimist, I'm a proud Indian, and I'm very proud to say that. To each and every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chakraborty, my good friend, the director, Mr. Dey, Omul Babu, Raju, who's rubbing his eyes, I wonder why, and all of you. Our former sheriff. A very good moment.